Okay, everyone, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar tonight on female pelvic health. Right now, I would like to introduce Dr. Laura Gistel, who is a urologist who has fellowship trained in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. She specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of urogenital conditions, including urinary incontinence, voiding dysfunction, overactive bladder, neurogenic bladder, pelvic organ, organ prolapse, and pelvic floor disorder. She earned her bachelor's degree in neuroscience with a minor in psychology at the New York University of Rochester and her medical degree with distinction in service to the community from the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. She completed her general surgery internship and urology residency at Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia and completed her specialized surgical training during her residency there at Temple. Dr. Gisto also served as Chief Resident in Urologic Oncology at Fox Chase Cancer Center. She went on to subspecialize in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery by completing a two-year ACGME accredited fellowship at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. She is a member of the Society for Urodynamics, Female Pelvic Medicine, and Urogenital Reconstruction, the American Urological Association, the International Continent Society, the International Neurourology Society, and the Society for Women in Urology. She was also inducted into the Arnold P. Gold Humanism Honor Society. So thank you for being with us, and thank you, Dr. Gisto. We're ready to go. And good evening. Welcome to our webinar. I'd like to thank you for joining us so I could tell you more about my specialty. So female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. It is quite a mouthful, and that's probably because it's a hybrid field. It actually combines both medicine and surgery, and we treat benign pelvic floor issues. And the point is to help the pelvic floor because this has a significant impact on your quality of life. Many of you guys listening today have these issues yourself, but more importantly, you might have friends and family who have these issues and are suffering in silence. So first understanding what the issues are and then who to seek care from will be a great help. And again, I thank you for being here today. So we'll be going over the agenda for tonight, which is ultimately what is the origin of female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery? Again, the mouthful. So we also call it FP, FPMRS. And then what are the common conditions treated by an FPMRS subspecialists. And the ones that we'll be discussing tonight, there are many, but I think the greatest hits or the big hitters are leakage of urine, vaginal bulge, pelvic floor changes with menopause, and pelvic pain. So to start us off, I just want to orient you with the organs of the female pelvic floor. And so on the left of the screen is the front of your body, if you're a female that is. On the right of your screen is your sacrum and tailbone. So if you took a fall, that's what you would land on. And in between are many organs. And so just to point it out and orient everyone again, this would be the bladder towards the front of the body. Sitting between it and the pelvic floor is the uterus and the vagina. And then at the back is the rectum. And so historically, as patients, we have associated each one of these organs with a single specialty. You know, the urologist got control of the bladder, your OBGYNs took care of the uterus and the vagina, and our friends in gastroenterology and colorectal surgery took care of the rectum. But the question is, you know, is that specialty mutually exclusive to those organs? And I think it goes deeper than that. And the truth of the matter is, you saw how close those organs were sitting in conjunction together. They work together in the same time and place, and they're supported by similar structures. So dividing them into individual organs and subspecialties maybe isn't the best options. Let's dive a little bit deeper and look at the pelvic floor. When we take away the organs, your pelvic floor is basically a bowl of muscles. And you can see here in this picture that there's a group of muscles, and they are very dynamic. They contract, they relax. Every time you take a deep breath, you sneeze, you swing, you dance, you do things. These relax or contract to keep everything inside you and to keep you dry. So they're a very dynamic set of muscles that support organs, but they're not alone. In addition to the muscles, there's also connective tissue. 
Now, us surgeons and doctors will call that connective tissue fascia, but what you need to know is that it is a strength layer, and that strength layer basically envelops pelvic floor organs. The same type of tissue will wrap itself around the rectum and the uterus and the vagina and the bladder. So in essence, the pelvic floor is a bowl that hugs all these organs. And so having a specialist that understands the muscles, the connective tissue, and all the organs there seems like a great person or a destination to take care of your pelvic floor issues. You know, if you need to think about it a little bit more, this is when I started my training, a great analogy. It's the dry dock analogy. And to understand that the pelvic floor really relies on everything around it, on the left is a boat docked in water. The water would be your pelvic floor muscles. Those ropes keeping the boat docked peacefully are the ligaments and connective tissue, and the boat itself would be the organs. You could see without a strong layer beneath it, like the pelvic floor muscles or the water, there's no way those ropes are holding up the boat on itself. Similarly, with laxity of the ropes, even if the water is still there, organs or the boat would shift. So we need to think about the pelvic floor as a collection of everything that's there and find somebody who could take care of all those things together. Pelvic floor disorders. These are some of the most common ones. Urinary incontinence or leakage of urine, fecal incontinence or leakage of stool, and then pelvic organ prolapse or the sensation of vaginal bulge. And what that really is, is a loss of support for the uterus, bladder, or rectum, leading to the descent of one or more of these organs into the vagina. What's important to note about these is these are not exclusive. So again, nearly 70% of patients with something like prolapse, that vaginal bulge, will have at least one other pelvic floor disorder. So instead of going to you know, individual doctors to take care of one organ, somebody who's had a mastery or, or expertise in all of them would be great to diagnose if you had multiple issues and then therefore how to treat them. So going back to the origin of FPMRS, you might be familiar with female urologists, the term female urologists, or urogynecologists. And these are specialty specific terms. They basically treat similar conditions, but the doctors had different training. So historically, if you did a residency or training for four years in OBGYN and wanted to take care of benign pelvic floor issues, you might subspecialize and go into a fellowship called urogynecology. And as a urologist, you might spend some time in a urology residency and then want to subspecialize in the female pelvic floor and those treatments, but you were labeled a female urologist. Now, both these doctors with different training want to take care of the same thing. So to improve healthcare for women everywhere, we started to look at, can we combine the curriculum of the two and make one standardized field? And so that's FPMRS, basically. And back in 2011, the American Board of Medical Specialties, the ABMS, approved the creation of FPMRS. And it is a board-certified fellowship. Now, what's interesting, even though that was almost 10 years ago, we still know the historical terms, female urologist and urogynecologist. And because I think people who specialize in female urology are in the minority, when a patient is looking for a doctor to focus on their female pelvic floor, they might not know that urologists have a subspecialty training. And so that's why we're having this talk tonight. So in terms of my path to female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, it was a long while. You know, I did college, I did medical school, I did six years of residency, which included time on general surgery, and then two extra years um, subspecializing in female pelvic medicine ultimately 16 years, but that's to get to an awesome subspecialty. So now we'll sort of top, tackle our topics that you are most interested in tonight, which is what are the common conditions that you might have, your friends or family might have, and that you should come see us to help treat. And so that's leakage of urine, vaginal bulge, pelvic floor changes with menopause and pelvic pain, and we'll do leakage of urine first. It's important to note that many people underestimate the consequences of urinary leakage. 
it is a very embarrassing topic. Whether you're at work and making multiple trips to the bathroom, whether you're at the movies with friends or driving in the car asking people to stop, it is embarrassing and it often causes so social isolation. To avoid embarrassment, people isolate themselves and stop doing the things that they wanna do. In that regard, we know there's higher rates of depressive, depressive symptoms because of this isolation. Additionally, people will leak and will leak in terms uh, or times of intimacy. And this, this is, you know, if you're having sex with your partner and you leak, that's something even if you have the most supportive partner in the world is very stressful and leads to less sexual satisfaction. So overall, urinary leakage can cause a lower quality of life. There's also this whole other realm that when you start trying to deal with the situation, the cost of protective garments and pads is very expensive. We found that almost a year's worth of pads may cost $1,200 for patients. And then there's the issue of uh, lower levels of overall health. So many people wake up or go into the bathroom frequently or going to try not to leak. And in essence, they might trick going to the bathroom and have a fracture. Also leaking all the time may cause skin irritation. This is Something that I offer in clinic and I'll share with you today, there are multiple types of urinary leakage. So first is stress incontinence, which is the leakage with coughing, laughing, and physical activity. There's another type of leakage, which we've termed overactive bladder. This is going frequently, having urgency, the I gotta go, I gotta go right now, and the incontinence associated with urgency. But you could have both. So when you see me in clinic, I kind of bring up this flow sheet to be like, what are your symptoms and what do you have? And then how are we gonna make shared decisions, patient and doctor, to figure out what I have in my toolkit, the medicine and surgery options to treat you best. This is the overall flow sheet and we'll go through fairly quickly. I would like to note that today, I'm not gonna talk about sort of the etiology or the origin of a lot of these things but more give you some bullet points on the treatments so you know there are things out there that might fit you best. So stress urinary incontinence, again, that leakage with cough, sneeze, exercise, and it's due to the weakness of the pelvic floor. Well, the truth is 35% of women experience this type of leakage, but the sad thing is one in four of these women actually seek treatment. So what are the treatments? We like to do things low and slow. We'll go with the minimally invasive or more conservative options and build our way up. And again, many people will start low and slow or go with the most definitive option there is. There's no right answer. There's only right answer for you. So the non-surgical options to start are listed here. And I list, list kind of two of the same things here, pelvic floor muscle training or Kegel exercises, and then pelvic floor physical therapy. And the idea there is that you could go to the gym and have a gym membership or you could have a personal trainer. So when it comes to pelvic floor physical therapy, that's like muscle training, but with a personal trainer. Uh, you go to a specialist who really understands the pelvic floor and your pelvic floor, and develops a routine and exercise regimen for you to strengthen it. Now for urinary leakage, 40 to 60% of women who do pelvic floor physical therapy will have great outcomes. However, it is also like going to the gym. If you stop going to the gym, you kind of lose that great outcome you got. Um, and if you stop doing your pelvic floor exercises, you'll lose the efficacy of that treatment. There are some other conservative options. There's pessary devices, and pessaries are vaginal inserts that go into the vagina and act to kink off the urethra, the tube that your bladder uses to empty itself. By adding some extra resistance by kinking it, you'll leak less. And so this is one such example, a pessary that's fitted to you and your size of your vagina. And if you have any vaginal bulge or droppage, there's other types of pessaries as visualized here. But say you don't want something in you all day, every day, there's also more single use or disposable vaginal inserts. And this is one such you could sort of get over the counter on the pharmacy aisle, and it's called an Impressa tampon. It works just like a tampon for periods, but it's put into the vagina, it's hourglass shape, and you can see how it kinks up the urethra there, creating some resistance. So if you cough, laugh, or sneeze while it's in, you have some extra bulking. Many people don't leak often. Maybe they go out dancing with their friends or out for a good night, and they only need a pessary for you know once every two weeks. This is a great option. There's some also there's some new options. In the same way you go to physical therapy, this brings physical therapy to you. There are shorts you could purchase 
that basically offer electrical stimulation that causes your pelvic floor to contract, basically simulating going to pelvic floor physical therapy. The plus to this one is that sometimes when you do exercises on your own, you fatigue with time, you get tired. But when energy is being delivered to cause muscle contraction, that doesn't fatigue, so you get a good workout. So this is also a very good conservative treatment option for stress urinary incontinence. But then we move on to maybe more definitive options, and that is either procedural or surgical options as listed here. That includes urethral bulking, slings, and suspensions. We'll go through those now. So if you want to talk about sort of less invasive to more invasive, urethral bulking is more of a procedure. We typically do it in the office. This is a depiction on the left of your bladder, your urethra. We can put a scope into your urethra, the tube you pee out of. And uh, over here on the left, you'll see if you have stress urinary leakage, it might be because your tube has lost support and is kind of wide open. But if we put some filler, or the analogy I like to make is sometimes women get their lips plumped for cosmetic reasons, you could plump up your urethra, bolster it decrease resistance so when you cough, laugh, or sneeze, urine won't come out. And so the rationale to urethral bulking really is if you co-apt or bulk up that urethra, when you cough, laugh, or strain, you have less chance of urine coming out. Here's a picture here really of the animation on the left, and on the right is real-time sort of uh, procedural video of how before and after the urethral, uh, urethra is more co-apted. Moving on, we have surgery. So surgery for stress urinary incontinence usually involves mid-urethral mesh slings. It's an outpatient vaginal surgery. Usually there's a vaginal incision, which is less than two centimeters, and two tiny skin incisions. A thin piece of mesh is positioned under the urethra, and this mesh is basically medical grade material called polypropylene. And this may sound familiar to you because it's been used for decades in hernia repairs and things like that. Ultimately, up to 90% of women are very happy with the outcomes of their mesh sling surgery. And for that reason, it is one of our gold standard treatments for uh, the condition. Here are two different types of ways we could play, place the mesh sling. In the picture on the left, uh, you can see the mesh is sitting like a hammock or a backboard or support underneath the urethra. And the mesh sort of goes behind your pubic bone. And on the right, it goes through a different area of the pubic bone. It's called the obturator canal. So a little different options there. There is a newer sling. It's called a mini sling. The mesh arms actually don't come out towards the skin, so it's a little bit less. Um, and it sits underneath the urethra like the others. This is a newer option. It has some promising data, three to five year data right now, which actually looks pretty good. But it doesn't have the long-term data like the other two I just discussed. Now, some women do get um, confused with this idea of vaginal mesh. They've heard about with vaginal mesh, uh, it's been banned, it's bad. You know, there's all the commercials and everything like that. But in essence, that was vaginal mesh that was used for prolapse or vaginal bulge repair surgeries. And you use large swaths or big pieces of mesh, like this big to put in your vagina to hoist up organs. Instead, for incontinence procedures, it's a very thin piece of mesh that goes under the urethra. Every society listed on this, on this screen right now supports it, and there's long-term data that shows it's safe, efficacious, and successful. In fact, the two different societies that really govern our fellowship basically say it's safe, effective, and it's helped millions of women. So I just wanted to dispel any fears that people have about mesh with stress urinary incontinence. Now, there are people who have had multiple procedures before and need something more, or some people who don't want mesh. In that case, we do have slings using your own tissue. So that is fascia, which is connective tissue, it's a strength flavor. You either take it from the abdominal wall or the lateral thigh. We harvest that piece. It's usually about two by eight centimeters. And then we fashion it into a sling. Now this sling is a little different from the mid urethral sling. It sits more at the bladder neck. And because of that, there's a slightly more increased chance of uh, bladder overactivity or trouble emptying. But there are very good long-term options. Again, it is one of our gold standard treatments for incontinence. However, I just would like to note it requires an extra incision 
there's more recovery from that. So just because it's your own tissue doesn't mean, you know, it's right for you. There's extra considerations for that. And lastly, I can't go into depth about this right now, but the wonderful thing I love about Chesapeake Urology is we have an amazing research department. We do clinical research trials, and we do have clinical trials, uh, things we could offer you that are on the cusp of being available to the masses that we could offer ahead of time. And so we do have clinical trials for stress urinary incontinence, so something to visit us about and find out about. So now I'm going to talk about the other type of leakage, overactive bladder. That's the urinary frequency, just going too much urgency, the I gotta go, I gotta go right now, and the leakage when you don't make it there in time. Now, 40 million people in the United States have an overactive bladder, but I could tell you 40 million people are not talking about it. It's a lot of men and it's a lot of women. Nearly 43% of women in the country have this issue. And in women, they leak more than men. So this is embarrassing. And it's important to note that the prevalence of the overactive bladder um, and the severity usually increase with age. So sometimes you'll have it, it'll stay the same, but often it'll get worse. So what are our treatment options? We go back to the flow chart. So this is what I pull out in the office. Again, do you have this type of leakage? And now overactive bladder is a very algorithmic treatment condition in that we have first tier, second tier, and third tier options. We typically start at the beginning, which is first line behavioral therapy. That's basically educating you about how you could help your bladder out with urgency, fre frequency, and linkage. And that's to reduce your bladder irritants, things like caffeine, citrus, and artificial sweeteners, to monitor your fluid intakes. Yeah, if you drink 64 ounces before you go to sleep, you're gonna wake up more, so if you cut that back, you might do a little bit better. Then there's our friends at Public Floor Physical Therapy again. They could teach you exercise on to how to sort of reduce the urgency reflex and suppress it on your own with doing nothing but contractions of the pelvic floor. So these are all great first line therapies. It's just you and your effort to treat this condition. But then we move on to these didn't work or didn't work well enough, what else can I do? And that's our next line, second line therapy. And that typically includes medications. Classically, we have two different brands or classes of medications to treat you. The one that's been around for decades and therefore there are many types of medications on this list are anticholinergics. They're really meant to decrease your bladder contractions, decrease episodes of the severity of urgency, and let you feel a little bit more and have more time between trips to the bathroom. There are side effects to this medication class though, blurry vision, dry mouth, constipation, and then there's the possibility of impaired cognition or memory. It is small, but that's fearful for some patients. So that's why it's nice to know we have other tools in the toolbox. We do have one other medication class, but you can see there's only one type of medication there and it's still a brand name. We don't have a generic of it yet. And this medication allows for relaxation of the bladder while you're filling. And again, it's to decrease your urgency and increase your capacity, how much you could hold, so you have more time to get to the, to the bathroom. I love this guy, whoever made the cartoon character for Morbetric. Um, maybe it's just because I'm a urologist, but I really like this, so how to put it in there. I like Morbetric or this beta-3 agonist because the side effects are less than the other class, the anticholinergics. If you had labile hypertension, hypertension that's all over the place, um, there, in the studies there may be a slight increase in your blood pressure, so I would not recommend or prescribe this if that was your case. Other patients might notice a stuffy nose or headache, but compared to the other side effect profile, this is pretty favorable. So now we go back. You know, Medications are great, but medications for your life are not great. What else can we do? And so these are our advanced treatment options. I'd like to note that this is a deep dive to talking about how they work, why they work, which one might work for you. Many of my colleagues at Chesapeake Urology had already give, given webinars on overactive bladder and sort of their excitement about the treatment therapies for them. I will be given another webinar in a few weeks talking about sort of the future of advanced treatment options. We'll be brief tonight knowing all of that. So for our advanced treatment options, basically the, the basic understanding is that bladder circuitry is not working. Either the nerves that sense bladder filling are too sensitive, or the nerves that cause muscle contraction are too overactive, 
or your spine, the relay station between your bladder and your brain, you know, your control station, um, that's not working right. And so the messages from the bladder to the brain aren't being relayed. And the reflex noted in the spinal cord just gives messages right back to the bladder. Oh, you're full? Okay, go. We're not going to even tell the brain you have to go. So all those things can be going on. We don't always know what it is for you, but these are the things we try to tackle in advanced treatment options. So the goal of advanced treatment is to modify the nerves, and we have two ways of doing that. We could do chemical modification, which is basically our bladder Botox injections, and we could do electrical modification, which two things, again, a mouthful, and outside the box. But when people consider them, it could be home run for them. And those include posterior tubular nerve stimulation and sacral neuromodulation. So we'll start with, of the three, what I consider the least invasive, it's posterior tubular nerve stimulation. So first I'll tell you what you do and then I'll tell you why. This is a treatment done in the office. It's basically an acupuncture needle that's placed near the ankle. A little stim box is attached to that acupuncture needle electrode and delivers some energy to the needle. You basically sit in a chair with your legs up, read a book, talk to somebody on the phone, take a nap for 30 minutes, minutes and then you're done with your treatment for the week and you resume your normal activities. But how and why does it work? So basically the nerve behind your ankle is called your tibial nerve. It runs all the way up back to your spinal cord and has a common intersection where your bladder nerves try to hit the spinal cord. So because if you deliver a little bit of energy to that nerve as it travels up the nerve in the leg, it'll again reach that same intersection where the bladder nerves hit and by sending energy up there can dampen the overactivity of the bladder nerves. Just going back there real quick, this treatment is a weekly treatment. You typically do 12 treatments up front once a week for 30 minutes in the office times 12. If it's helpful, you usually need to do a maintenance therapy thereafter to keep the nerves modified, which is usually one visit. So moving forward, we're going to talk about bladder Botox, probably the next step in sort of invasiveness. It's a procedure done in the office. Now, onobotulinum toxin A, it's a naturally occurring protein. It's going to naturally degrade with time then. And so this is a protein we could put under your muscle layer with a scope in the office. And the protein basically blocks signaling of the muscle. When the muscle goes to squeeze, it's been calmed. This is a great option for patients because it's a five minute procedure in the office. It usually lasts four to six months. It's quick and easy. Um, you could drive yourself. There's no big anesthesia to the procedure. And it reduces your episodes of daily leakage by half. Almost a quarter of patients who have urgency leakage will be completely dry with this treatment. Next, we go on a little deeper to our more invasive therapy, but often the most uh, effective, and that's called sacral neuromodulation. So again, we have a lot of webinars on this. I'm not gonna go dive deep into the topic, but sacral neuromodulation is basically a way to modulate the reflexes that influence the bladder, sphincter, and pelvic floor. Again, it uses mild electrical energy pulses similar to the posterior tibial nerve stimulation, but instead it's targeted to the sacral nerves kind of right exactly where your bladder nerves run, not as far down as your leg. This is a try it before you buy it kind of therapy. We usually do a test in the office where a sort of external device uh, to see if after nerve evaluation it helps improve your symptoms and if so we place a long-term plantable device. Again the goal is to reduce your urinary frequency urgency and leakage and greater than 80 percent of people will report success at six months. This is a visualization of kind of how it works. There's a battery or a bladder pacemaker that goes under the skin um, below your pant line. Um, there's a little wire that it doesn't go in the nerve, it doesn't go in the spinal cord, it doesn't go in any organ. It just goes near the nerves that control your bladder and deliver some energy to it. The cool thing about this therapy is that it is constantly evolving and we have a lot of great options for you. So listed here in about two weeks, this is everything that would be available to you. Um, you have rechargeable or recharge free options that are varying sizes and deliver different energy. So again, your female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery specialists can help you decide what's best for you.
a big topic. We're going to move on quickly to vaginal bulge because this is something that affects many, many women and they don't know who to go to. Pelvic organ prolapse. It's a thing that happens in greater than 50% of people over the age of 50. Women that are older than 65 are the fastest growing segment of our population and half of them are gonna have this. Well, that's an issue, go find a doctor, come find us. And so what are your risk factors? There's nature and there's nurture. There's things you have no control over and that's your family history, your ethnicity, your age, sort of the makeup of your collagen in your body and if you have any neuromuscular diseases. Similarly, there are things that happen in your life that doesn't happen to anybody else. The size of your baby, if you had a vaginal delivery, if you've had other pelvic surgeries, if you weigh a little bit more, if you smoke or have a chronic cough, all those things can contribute to you having a vaginal bulge. Briefly, we went over this in the beginning, but this would be your normal anatomy. The left of the screen is the front of your body, the right is the back, and you have your bladder, your uterus, your vaginal canal, and your rectum. Any of these things can bulge down due to laxity of muscles and connective tissue. When the bladder falls down, that's called a cystocele or an anterior compartment prolapse. When your uterus falls down, that's an apical compartment prolapse or a uterovaginal prolapse. When your posterior compartment bulges down or your rectum bulges down, that's called a rectocele. And the truth is you could have one, two, or all three of these components. You need someone to evaluate to figure out which one you have and how to treat it. Now, if you've had a hysterectomy in the past, you don't have a uterus that's hanging down, but the top of your vaginal tube, which is kind of like a tube sock, can be inverted. And it could be flipped out and it could be falling down. So that's another option. So what are your treatments? Well, just like incontinence, you have conservative treatments and you have surgical interventions. Again, we have to find what's right for you. The truth of the matter is most patients have asymptomatic vaginal bulge or prolapse. They had babies, you know, they've, they have a little bit of droppage of their organs, but it's not going past the entrance of the vagina. So they might not know it or it's not bothersome. And patients with this or mild sim symptoms, we don't have to do anything about. We could diagnose it, but that doesn't mean we have to treat it. Now remember, we have medicine and surgery components to treating you for most of your conditions. Symptomatic patients that don't want surgery, might not be a surgical candidate, or really just want to start with the less invasive options, have pessaries as an option. These are vaginal inserts, similar to those incontinence inserts we talked about earlier, that will be fitted towards you, put in your body, and can help support and pick up your prolapse. This is a great option for people who don't want more invasive options yet. But when we get into invasive options, it's a mouthful. There's a lot. And that's why you have to see a specialist. We're not gonna go over all this tonight. I just want you to know, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox. Say you would like a vaginal surgery and uh, your vaginal canal is falling down. We could use your own native tissues. You have a ligament called the sacro spinous ligament to sort of tack up your vaginal tube to your own ligament so it scars down and is held back in place. Similarly, if you have a uterus that's hanging down and you don't want that uterus out, it could be removed and then the vaginal tube has to be hitched up or put back into place. We could hook it up to a different ligament called the uterosacral ligament and that's called a vault suspension, another option. If you want probably the most definitive uh, or most successful outcome for vaginal prolapse, we could do an open abdominal or robotic case that fixes a piece of mesh, so it's an augmented repair to the vaginal canal. As you can see here, a piece of mesh is put on the front of the vagina and the back of the vagina, like a little cap, and then it's tacked to your tailbone or sacrum to hitch or pull it up, also another option for people. And then patients who are no longer sexually active but have severe prolapse, we have options for them too. This is one of our quickest procedures in the OR where we're basically able to reduce the prolapse and close the opening to the vagina, and then nothing will fall out anymore. Now this excludes somebody from penetrative sex, but is a great option for older patients who need a quick surgery. So moving forward the bread and butter of things I see in the office. Pelvic floor changes with menopause. So this is now called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. My specialty loves wordy things. It used to be called vaginal atrophy, but that was also not a good term. I don't think we did any better. 
But the idea is that there are various menopausal symptoms due to a low estrogen state. In terms of genital, that's dryness, burning, and irritation. For sexual symptoms, that's lack of lubrication or discomfort and pain. And then for urinary symptoms, that's urgency, dysuria, or current urinary tract infections, or things called urethra caruncles or prolapse, which are basically hemorrhoids of the urethra. So what are our treatment options? There's one mainstay, and that's vaginal estrogen cream. There's been a lot of misconceptions about hormone therapy. I think over the last decades, we've flip-flopped about if it's good or bad. When I tell you about vaginal estrogen cream therapy, it, it's a topical treatment. Just like facial moisturizer moisturizes your face, this affects just the vagina. And why or how? The vagina has hormone receptors. And when you're postmenopausal and you don't get estrogen to those receptors anymore, the tissue becomes less robust, it's not vascularized, it's not lubricated, and most importantly, the pH of the vagina with a lot of estrogen is acidic. So good bacteria, lactobacillus acidophilus can live down there. But when you don't have estrogen stimulation, then the environment changes. It becomes more basic, the pH goes up, it becomes thinner, it's not lubricated. And when the pH goes up and it's basic, the good bacteria can't live there anymore. Bad bacteria move in, the stuff from the GI system, E. coli, Proteus, Enterococcus, Klebsiella. So what are the benefits of returning some estrogen sort of on a maintenance therapy treatment to your vagina? Well, it reduces the risk of urinary tract infections. It improves your tissue robustness and it increases lubrication. Additionally, there's been many studies that show that using vaginal estrogen therapy regularly can minimize symptoms of urinary incontinence, both stress and overactive bladder. So great options to see your female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery specialist about. So last and very quickly is pelvic pain. Now this is a Pandora's box, but if you're trying to find someone to quarterback your pelvic pain and get you get you diagnosed and to people who could help you, that would be us. Very quickly, pelvic pain treatment. Really, I'm just going to focus on the pelvic floor here. I stress the importance of the pelvic floor as support to your organs. They're supposed to be dynamic. They're supposed to relax and contract. Sometimes they could be too tight, like a charley horse in the calf. And in that case, they can impinge on your nerves of your pelvic floor, and they can cause referred pain. Now, my analogy for patients in the office is women have atypical symptoms of heart attacks. They sometimes feel on the shoulder or the chin. That's referred pain. The insult is to your heart, but you feel it elsewhere. That happens with the pelvic floor as well. And so you might have a tight pelvic floor. Your muscles are tight. The nerves might be hurt, but you feel it in the urethra or you feel it in the bladder. And so I hear that all the time. And this is called levator spasm or myofascial pain syndrome. And so we have options. Our friends, the pelvic floor physical therapists, again, we send everybody there. They work on muscle relaxation exercises, biofeedback, and internal massage. But we have other tools in the toolbox again, trigger point injections, and using our friend Botox from the overactive bladder world to inject into the pelvic floor for relaxation of those overactive muscles. There's a lot more we treat in FPMRS. We treat things like leakage of stool, or fecal incontinence. And when we talked about those bladder pacemakers, the sacral nerve modulation, the similar therapy can be used to treat leakage of stool. We also take care of vaginal cysts, urethral strictures, diverticulum, which are little outpouchings of the tube you pee out of that might cause you to dribble or have pain with sex, and then fistulas, which are connections between the vagina and the bladder, the vagina and the bowel, or the vagina and the ureter, the tube that drains the kidney to the bladder. So these are things that we like to work up and offer treatments to you. I appreciate your time and attention. We have a huge field. There's a lot we have to offer you. I hope you come find us or help your friends come find us. At Chesapeake Urology, we have many specialists in all our pods or areas across Maryland that specialize in the subspecialty and can potentially help you and your friends. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Gisto. So we do have one question. I have been diagnosed with a condition called osteitis pubis. Is this something that you can comment on, please? So osteitis pubis, uh, it's inflammation of that pubic bone, the bone that sits in front of the bladder. 
There's many reasons why you can be diagnosed with it. Sometimes he's had previous pelvic surgeries or abdominal surgeries that have sort of entered that space where the bone is. It's hard. I'm sure it's been hard for you because you've probably had pain and pressure and it's been might have taken a while to diagnose unless you've found a specialist who's got an imaging and found it. Usually it's conservative treatment and therapy, time, and typically something called NSAIDs. So your leave, your ibuprofen, things like that to reduce the inflammation and the discomfort. Uh, but ultimately it's one of those things that a little reassurance in time should fix. Okay, thank you. We have a second question. She says, I've had prolapse repair surgery twice. The last time my bladder was paralyzed for two months after the surgery. How common is this? The thing about female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, why it's great is because the organs that used to belong to individual subspecialties can now belong to us. And that's great because those organs share mutual nerves and uh, muscles and blood supplies. So oftentimes people have removal of their uterus and then you know, they lose sensation to their bladder and they don't understand why. And we understand why because some of those nerves and structures are shared. It is common. It doesn't happen all the time, but we have diagnostic tests. We do office procedures. We have something called urodynamics, which is kind of, I like to tell patients like the EKG of the bladder, where we figure out how well your bladder fills, senses, stores, if it over squeezes without your permission and how well it squeezes when you do give it permission um, to see if your nerves were affected by previous surgery. And then if they were, um, once we've characterized it, kind of go into our toolbox again and see what options we might be able to offer you. Yes, because nerves sort of envelop the bladder, the uterus, the vagina, and the rectum, and surgeries kind of will sometimes violate those planes to surgically repair and correct and restore those organs, we can affect the nerves in the meantime. So it is a known consequence of surgery, but but often we could help treat it. She wants to know how long it takes to see results once you begin using medication for the, for the urge? That is a great question. I'm actually, you know, I get very passionate about, about overactive bladder because we have great friends in primary care and other specialties who might start you on a medication for urgency but they're tackling other things like your heart or your sugars or your lipids. And they might, you might be on a medication for three months, six months, a year. And the question is, are you satisfied with your improvement in symptoms or have you even had any improvement in symptoms or have you had more side effects than help? And so what we know and what we kind of laser focus pinpoint on is that if we offer you a medication, a trial of that medication is four to six weeks. So we often have you coming back frequently, and some people might think that's overkill, but if I give you a medication, we're checking in in a month to a month and a half. It's a, if it's helpful, high five. If it's not, we got something else to offer you, whether it's another medication or one of our advanced treatments. But four to six weeks is the time frame I give to see if the medication helps you. Again, I just wanted to thank for everybody for their attention. You listening, any sort of education or, or information you learned about treatment options is something to offer you know, friends and family and encourage them to go visit a doctor to talk about it. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Gisto. And thank you for everyone who has participated this evening. And if you have any questions or would like more information, or I know one person wanted the name of a specialist, please contact us at chesapeakurology.com slash telehealth, and we would love to work with you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Good night.